Hello. Good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Kaveh, a board certified uh, Stanford and Harvard trained anesthesiologist and integrative medicine specialist. I'm also the medical director for a ketamine infusion clinic where I help patients overcome very debilitating <clears throat> treatment, refractory depression, anxiety, and other uh, medical, uh, physical, and mental health conditions. So I want to take this time today to talk about what happens to our bodies under anesthesia and what happens to your breathing when we enter those levels of anesthesia depth that are, are so deep that not only are we letting go of our often suffering, and that's the dog Karma who is just running into the lights. Thanks, Karma. <laughs> what happens when we go into those depths of anesthesia where we give up all of those sufferings that we're trying to escape from? You know, you gotta ask yourself, what do Heath Ledger, Judy Garland, Michael Jackson, Prince, what do they all have in common? What are they trying to escape? And they're all ultimately, they died from overdoses of anesthetic related uh, medications. So what they all have in common is that they stop breathing. And that's why when you're in the operating room with me, breathing and anesthesia are the most important parts of, of surgery to keep patients alive. And I'm actually gonna walk you through what those different um, tools are to maintain your airway when you're asleep. But we have a lot of questions we gotta get through first before we get there. And the first is from Linda. Uh, thank you for your vulnerability in sharing this, but you're this, you're asking about how we can develop trust with our doctors, especially in, um, <clears throat> so I'm just looking at all of these fantastic comments. Hello everyone. I'll try to get to every single one of them, um, that have come in so far for the, the rest of our time together. So Linda, how do you find trust in your doctors, especially doctors who you're putting your life in their hands, like in your anesthesiologist, your surgeon, et cetera. And Linda, there's no one size fits all, of course. It depends on what led to the loss of trust in the first place and why there's a need to rebuild trust with your doctors. In my case in particular, I can only share what I do with my patients. And as I've discussed before, I call my patients the night before surgery to begin building a therapeutic alliance so that they know who I am. I'm not just some rando coming up on the day of surgery saying, hey, we're going to go to sleep and I'm going to turn off your body. Like we said earlier, even turn off your breathing. We'll get to more of that in a minute. But trust is the most important part to healing, whether it's through a psychedelic guided experience with a physician. I'm not condoning the illegal use of any hallucinogens. Or if it's in the operating room with anesthesia or any other type of substance where you're letting go of control your body uh, to somebody else. There has to be knowledge of who you're uh, trusting your body with. And more importantly, why is there the lack of trust in the first place? Often it's from, it's from a betrayal of trust. Uh, I think I know you've mentioned in previous lives that there have been betrayals of trust before, but we have to go more in depth about why that's there and how future physician patient relationships can overcome that. No one size fits all. But I will say the most important thing for my patients when they're going under before any of these breathing tools that I'm going to show you in a minute go into their bodies, the most important thing is that I want them to trust me because if they trust me, if something bad happens during surgery, which happens more frequently than you probably know, I, I'm just reviewing a case from last week where something terrible happened to a patient who was otherwise healthy or routine surgery, the more trust patients have in their doctors, the less likely those experiences are going to go on to lead to PTSD. So it's very important what you're asking, Linda. Uh, uh, Chris from Connecticut, great to see you as well. Can I talk about pre-oxygenation and what it, uh, why some doctors do it and others don't? Okay, so we'll get to pre-oxygenation, but let me tell you why pre-oxygenation is so important, whether it's for a ketamine infusion or a ketamine, pardon, uh, anesthetic or a propofol anesthetic, all of these anesthesia medications turn off parts of our brains. They're not the same as sleep. Even though I tell patients that they're going to go to sleep, anesthesia is by no means sleep. Why? Because when you're under anesthesia, we need to breathe for you. Here is the oldest type of breathing apparatus here. I'm going to pull it out and you can actually see that if I squeeze here, air is going to come out the other end connected to a mask. These are all standard medical connections. Now you can actually put this mask on somebody and you can breathe for them, right? 
We need to breathe for you because anesthesia medications and quite frankly, all those med medications that were overdosed by Heath Ledger, Prince, Michael Jackson, Judy Garland, they turn off parts of your brain that first of all, might lead us to feeling suffering, depression, anxiety, et cetera. But at the wrong dose, we'll turn off the parts of our brain that also control the rest of our body, our breathing, our heart rate, uh, blood flow to our critical organs, our kidneys, etc. So it's like the poison is in the dose for some of these, and really all of these medications, whether they come naturally from plants, just look at codeine or morphine, they come from plants, atropine, digoxin, etc. I have so many videos on natural plants that end up in the emergency room and the operating room because they're so powerful. It's all down to the dose. But it's even more critical for these anesthetic-based medications that come from opioids, that come from, um, opioids are the biggest one, but propofol, uh, the Michael Jackson drug, et cetera. So we need to pre-oxygenate because we have to fill up your lungs with oxygen before you fall asleep, before you stop breathing. We have a very narrow window, anywhere from three to nine minutes, to get a breathing tube into your trachea to breathe for you or a breathing tube above your trachea. So we have you breathe 100% oxygen for a couple of minutes. And then once you stop breathing, we have a short amount of time to place a breathing tube like this one. This is one of the most common ones I place. It's called an LMA. It doesn't go into the trachea. It sits right above it. You see this area here? You can actually connect all of these to this bag. When we say bag mask ventilate, it's what we're doing. This goes into the patient's mouth like that sits right above their glottis. And then we connect it to something to breathe for them, right? These connectors are all standard so that in emergency situations, nobody's looking for adapters. If it's a case of sedation and I don't wanna place a breathing tube, I might place this once I'm done pre-oxygenating or while I'm pre-oxygenating or for any number of reasons, this is called an oral airway. I can almost put it all the way in my mouth. It goes back here, just behind your tongue, to help your breathing, especially in cases of uh, obstructive sleep apnea. And then lastly is the classic endotracheal tube, this one here that actually sits in the trachea. So it goes all the way back past the vocal cords. I've shown you many videos of me placing it and actually where the vocal cords are opening and closing with those cameras. You can see where I place it. Same thing, this can attach once this stylet is removed, this is a flexible piece of plastic to help guide it through the vocal cords. But the same thing, it attaches to here. Why do these matter? Because all those terrible deaths, Michael Jackson, et cetera, could have been overcome if there was a breathing tube around to help them breathe when they overdosed. Not only let go of all their suffering, the anxiety, depressions, fears, et cetera, but ended up losing control of their breathing, stopped breathing, and suffered a heart attack or stroke because their oxygen levels went too low. That's why we use things like Narcan out in the field and why EMTs are so well trained in how to place these basic airways so that they can squeeze the bag and breathe for the patient because their brain is literally, it's not asleep, it is completely offline. So anyways, we pre-oxygenate Chris so we maximize the amount of time we have before the airway goes in. Um, great. Um, Kay says, my bowel perfed in the hospital. I kept begging for help and telling my doctors that something was wrong. Felt like my guts were exploding. They didn't believe me. Kay, I'm very sorry that, that it happened. If you had a question about it, I'm happy to field it, but I'm very sorry that that, that happened. Wow. Uh, Courtney, hi back to you. Um, no user says, about to get all four wisdom teeth out. I'm a little nervous. So where so this is, comes up all the time, probably the most common question I get on social media is about, I'm really anxious before my surgery. How do I overcome that? And it's going to come from recognizing that most fears, most anxieties come from the three C's that we've talked about before, control, certainty, and um, blanking on the last C control, certainty, and, uh, oh my gosh, 
I, I'm embarrassed on the inside. It doesn't happen very often. <laughs> um, control. Uh, well, I'm going to have to come back with the last C there, but we'll get there. All anxieties come when we lose control of a situation, when we're uncertain of the outcome. And when patients are going to go under anesthesia, you don't know what happens to your body after the, after the, the mask goes on because you're falling asleep. We're wiping your memories of the medications that we're giving you. So there's many, way, many reasons why the anxiety comes up because we're giving up control, we're uncertain of the situation, et cetera. And that's why understanding at least to some basic level, what's going to happen to your body, what you can expect is going to happen when you wake up is the first step in being able to allay fears and anxieties, which have very real effects when you're under anesthesia. It affects how much anesthesia you need, how much pain you're going to have when you wake up and so forth. But unless we, for ourselves, thought about why we're afraid in the first place, it's very difficult to get those fears under control. Um, I'm really happy that you mentioned that, though. And that you're vulnerable and sharing your, your anxieties there. And I wish you the best for your wisdom teeth surgeries. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. Courtney, do those with epilepsy require higher doses of anesthesia? Courtney, yes, because anti-seizure medications cause biochemical changes in the brain that increase anesthesia medication requirements. Very good question. Um, hey, Darion, so good to see you on here. I'm really happy that you're learning so much. Heidi, how do I decide to use the LMA or the endotracheal tube? Very, very good. Um, the LMA is my breathing tube of choice because it doesn't go past the vocal cords. If you're not going past the vocal cords, it's simply too big to do that. You're lowering the risk of, of sore throat, of scratchy voice, and in some cases, vocal cord dysfunction. So if I have an opera singer whose livelihood depends on singing and having a pristine voice, I'm going to want to avoid placing this past the vocal cords. You know, there's a little balloon here. And what can happen, we need this tube, I'm sorry, we need this balloon here to be inflated. Because when it's inflated, like this here, this prevents vomit from going into your lungs should you be vomiting when you're asleep. The problem is that this same tube, you saw how big it is. This tube can actually pull, if it pulls against your, if these are, my, if these are the vocal cords here, and this tube is here, you can imagine it um, putting strain or pressure on the vocal cords. So whenever possible, I like to avoid using this tube. There's fewer medications that your body needs if you're not getting the tube. Because if you get the tube, you need more medication to tolerate a tube being between your vocal cords. It's one of the most stimulating things that can happen to the human body is having a breathing tube placed past your vocal cords. You need a lot more anesthesia to be able to tolerate it. So the LMA, you simply don't need that much. In oral air, but you don't need that much. However, if a patient is too anxious to tolerate the sedation for a case, um, has too much acid reflux where I'm afraid that they might vomit. And none of these breathing tubes can prevent vomit from going down into the trachea. In those cases, we need to use that endotracheal tube despite its relatively minor, rare side effects. Um, obviously, it's much safer to use this than to not use it. Good question, Heidi. Photocan from Malta, Gabriel from Malta. I'm currently studying psychology at university. Very interested in antidepressant drugs used in the operating room. Um, we can talk all about antidepressant drugs. The most important one is going to be something like ketamine that we've talked about before, an NMDA receptor antagonist that can be very effective for treating treatment refractory, meaning depression or anxiety that is not responded to regular medications, which remember have all sorts of side effects themselves. Did you know that insomnia or REM sleep disruption is a side effect of SSRIs? Did you know that sexual dysfunction is a known side effect of SSRIs? Do you know that rebound depression and rebound symptoms are a side effect of SSRIs as well? Meaning that when you take these antidepressant medications, you're causing biochemical changes in the brain, just like how when you take any other medication, such that when you stop taking the medication, there's a withdrawal. 
And that withdrawal, in fact, can, that withdrawal can lead to worsening of the symptoms you had before the medications went in. These are just the nasty side effects and inconvenient truths of any medications we use in the West, in Western conventional medicine. They're life-saving. I use them every day. However, when they're used over time, whether they be proton pump inhibitors for acid reflux, whether they, whether they be blood pressure medications, the body has to adjust to medications that it's getting. And when it adjusts to those medications, it can overcompensate to lead to long-term complications with chronic use. Uh, Shani, when I take opioids, Percocet morphine, I get such horrible gut pain, absolutely horrible. Um, and that's why, Shani, I, uh, I'm so sorry that you've had that. It's very common. That's why I always advocate for nerve blocks, acupuncture, uh, NSAIDs, Ketorolac is what we use in the West, Tylenol, uh, et cetera, to avoid opioids whenever possible. So where clinical hypnosis, guided imagery, et cetera, all come in as well. Ketamine also, I don't know if you know this, but ketamine and methadone are different than other pain medications. Ketamine isn't an opioid and methadone is a synthetic opioid that also has an NDA receptor antagonism like ketamine. So they, it's why they're so powerful for addressing chronic pain because they're not just regular opioids that have those nasty side effects, but they have additional properties as well. Michelle, very good to see you. I hope you're uh, recovering well from everything that we've talked about before. How do we choose a medical center that is not a hospital? What precautions should we take? Michelle, that depends uh, on whether we're talking about surgery, talking about minor medical procedures, outpatient offices. Without more information, I can't really answer that question. So feel free to follow up there. Mrs. Eyes, the morphine pumps are kind of dangerous. Uh, they are. Morphine pumps or any opioid pump, whether it be dilated fentanyl morphine, is when a patient might press a button to get a little bolus of pain medication. So it's safe in the sense that you need to be awake enough to press the button. However, safety issues come up if there's a family member who thinks their family member is in pain, but really is not in pain, and the family member presses the button, that can end up unfortunately leading to an overdose, like we said, Judy Garland, Prince, et cetera, that can lead to overdose and death. Morphine pumps, fentanyl pumps, like I said, patient controlled analgesia is typically safe when the patient controls it, not if somebody else is controlling it. Uh, Courtney, is it okay to take prescription medications for high blood pressure, depression, anxiety, and epilepsy before anesthesia and surgery? Courtney, uh, most medications are safe to take, but you gotta ask your doctors for the specifics. It's a question I get asked all the time. There's no one size fits all solution. Crazy cat lady, uh, I'll show you my cat if she comes by in here. <laughs> They're just, the dog and cat are, are fighting outside the office right now, but no, I'm sure they'll come in again. I'll show you my cat. Uh, I like to ask, out of curiosity, about the first meds given when applying general anesthesia. Okay, so the first medication, I mean, it depends on the surgery, depends on the anesthesia given, depends on so many factors. In my case, depends on what is this patient struggling with. If there's somebody who's high anxiety, I'm gonna give them a different medication. If it's a patient who I'm trying to work um, actually, just this last week, I had a patient who's been struggling for such a long time to quit smoking. I'm going to give them a different medication up front before they fall asleep to utilize clinical hypnosis as much as possible for them to have the highest chance of quitting cold turkey after anesthesia, after they wake up, which is a possibility. Oh, and, and here's the cat. All right. Crazy cat lady. I hope you appreciate my little kitty here. And then Mochi. Ah. All right. She'll hang out with us here for a little bit. I hope you can still hear me through the microphone. Typically the most, oh, make yourself at home. Most common medication is typically midazolam or Versed. Um, and the one that made you feel woozy. Um, oh, there goes the 